Tate Chronicles now transmitting. Welcome to the Tate Chronicles on Healthcare Now Radio. And now, here's your host, Jim Tate. Good day, citizens of the free world. From border to border, coast to coast, and to all the ships at sea, I bring you a warm welcome. This is your correspondent, Jim Tate, and thank you for tuning in today to the Tate Chronicles. Join me as we cut through the fog that exists at the leading edge of healthcare technology. My guest today is none other than Dr. George Matthew, Chief Medical Officer at the Daedalus Group. Dr. Matthew is also continuing to practice medicine as a hospitalist. Daedalus provides services and products to uh, support a digitally enabled healthcare ecosystem. Their vision is a really promotion of change in healthcare delivery from the episodic centric approach, which we're familiar with, uh, to really continuum of care. Data Loose offers multiple and diverse solutions for each phase of the continuum of care. And Dr. Matthew, welcome to the Tate Chronicles. Jim, thank you so much for letting me come on. Um, uh, really is very appropriate your own because I want to talk about some of the uh, challenges and solutions in healthcare data interoperability. Since you're a practicing provider, especially hosp- uh, hospitalist, I'm sure you are frequently presented with caring for patients that you've never seen and you're not familiar with in a clinical data sense. So what type of challenge is this uh, in terms of uh, getting uh, information, clinical information about a patient and how do you do that? How do you respond to these challenges? You know, Jim, you and I had talked a little bit about this, both having uh, clinical experiences in the past. So, you know, we both have been through the typical paper through the facts mm-hmm. um, and especially, you know, having to admit people from the emergency room or from other services into the uh, hospital. You know, I'm definitely uh, comfortable, but also a little tired of having to get a patient, start from scratch and doing a history mm. and physical, yes. and then trying to then get a pound of, of facts materials through so I can get information, you know, whether it's labs that have just been run or history on the patient uh, or people they've seen or specialists they've seen so I can put together a complete picture. Obviously, some of that has changed over the last couple of years, especially because many people not only have adopted electronic health records, but they are using similar systems and similar standards to allow for some of that information to transfer through. But due to the fact that every system has its own consents and permissions, we still have a lot of what we used to deal with back in the day, which is having to call the original provider or have, in my case, we have residents, having interns and residents call after them for days after to get information to piece that puzzle together and really figure out what's going on with that patient. Well, and, um, for, for those that are um, a listening audience today, um, the whole concept of a hospitalist who is a uh, provider really based inside the hospital uh, may or may not have their own practice outside of a hospital. But um, uh, when patients get, get admitted to the hospital, uh, the concept of having providers who are totally hospital-based, uh, who are familiar with the uh, uh, really how a particular hospital system works, ha- how to quickly get tests done, how to get uh, diagnostic um, referrals done, um, it, it kind of just speeds up the process. And so, I don't know, was it maybe 10 years ago that the whole concept of uh hospitalist uh came into being how new is that concept uh it, it, it's been around for a little while i'd say mm. closer to 20 but it's okay. definitely become into its own over the last decade or so because many hospital systems wanted to have more consistency right. um, in how they admitted people to the hospital and managed those people in the hospital plus you know the you know the traditional way of having your own practice and then having to go around on the patients, it's just gotten to a point now where it's very difficult to maintain that. Many people try to do that, but then to have that 24 seven coverage, to be able to hand off some of that responsibility so you can live your life, you know, see your family, get some sleep. That's definitely become part of the norm. And especially for hospital systems as they've uh, just like 
payers, just like private equity firms, have acquired practices. Many hospitals believe that from a fiscal perspective, it's easier to control the costs if mm-hmm. you own the talent. Well, uh, you you referenced um, earlier that uh, how you obtain these healthcare records can be mm-hmm. a complex process. And there's certainly multiple challenges that individual organizations face while trying to access uh, records. And let's talk through some of the major current challenges. I, I know sure. one of the big challenges is uh, privacy concerns. Yes. So uh, what, I'd like to hear your comments just around privacy concerns and, you know, uh, trying to obtain records. Uh, it's it's a challenge uh funnily enough for providers and patients to get those records sometimes because um as you know because of the high tech act and because of now tefka while there's requirements to be able to share that information each institution is responsible for how that information is transmitted so a lot of the times each institution has its own approach mm. to privacy whether it's uh, multiple consents, documentation, uh, permissions from the patient. A lot of that documentation has to be held and monitored and maintained, similar to a compliance function at a bank. So it it creates a lot of administrative headache, but it's also very important because the last thing we want is some of this very, very private and sensitive information getting out without any responsibility being taken by the people holding it. We We have a commitment to the patient. And, you know, they trust us with their most sensitive information. We have to have some type of protection for it. I do think, though, that a lot of the time, the way these things are set up, it doesn't really make it easy for a patient to get their own information, which is, you know, counterintuitive. Sure. Um, While we're very strict in some ways, if you look across the pond uh, where Daedalus is based out of in Europe, Mm -hmm. um, they have the... Uh, global data privacy regulations, the GDPR, mm-hmm. that has a huge amount of requirement put on there to make sure that people have control over their data. They even have the right to be forgotten if they want to be by certain institutions uh, based on whether they're classified as data processes or not. All of this is built out with the idea that data is privacy, if you will, is a right by the citizen. That's not really how we view it in the U.S., and to be honest, most of the data that's uh, that's here that held by hospitals is, except in one state, owned by the hospital system to be used as they see fit. So I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I apologize, I don't have a simple answer for privacy. I do know it's something we need to deal with quickly. Individual states are not coming up with their own privacy laws because people are so concerned about what's happening with their data. And, you know, because we have this patchwork of things, it makes it even more complex for me as a physician to try to get that data, to try to put together that complete picture so I can help the patient. Well, and, uh, one thing you kind of touched on is uh, not only the patient, but who they have declared as authorized uh, individuals to access it. You know, a lot of times uh, uh, somebody go to their family practice the first time they go or internist and they sign a piece of paper or uh, digitally sign a piece, uh, a document uh, that makes uh, where they list one person who's authorized to access their records. And uh, that really is is never updated. Yep. Uh, and so uh, I'm sure you've experienced that many times as a hospitalist or, you know, you certainly hear anecdotally about trying to get records and there's confusion around the authorization itself. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's funny you mentioned that about the uh, about the uh, consent forms when you walk in the hospital. Um, you know, you usually get a given between three and 20 forms to sign. And there's at least a few there that give the hospital the right to share your data, not only within their practitioners, but however they see fit. And it's a strange thing because in some ways you're signing away your right to your data. But in some cases, right, they're actually not willing to treat you unless you do that. So exactly. a lot more has to happen for that. That has to be evolved a little more so people can understand what they're what they're agreeing to and what they're signing away. Because, you know, for me, at least when people come to the hospital, they come to be helped. They don't realize they're being put into some type of data processing group that's going to be using their data for 
third, you know, for tertiary uses. And that's, that's something that needs to be made more clear to folks so they can understand what's happening. Well, that's the challenge around privacy concerns. Uh, next on my list is the actual limited access to electronic records. You kind of referenced that a little bit about uh, providers using different EHR systems that maybe the plumbing, so to speak, is there for them to communicate with each other. But the actual sharing of those records between providers uh, really lags. It does. It does. And, you know, it's it's a funny thing about this, Jim, because, you know, every time people come up, come up, you know, there's this whole idea, especially people that come from outside of healthcare. It's, well, why aren't you guys like the banking system? Why right. aren't you like the Internet? Why can't you share information? And for me, the issue has never been a technology issue. We've always been able to share data. Mm-hmm. A lot of it comes down to people, process and culture. You know, there is and there are still business incentives to not sharing information, especially for a lot of the incumbents in healthcare. And, you know, I think what we're finding, though, is that as people are realizing what's happening, it's 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 kind of eroding that trust in the system, which means that they're less likely to share their data, which means they're less likely to use the system. I don't know if you recall, but um, during the pandemic, there was a big push for people to try to participate in contact tracing at a state by state level. Oh, correct. Sure. Right. And, you know, when people found out that Apple and Google were behind the standards, even though they had tried to create a privacy preserving approach and they were sharing data, nobody wanted to sign up. Right. Nobody wanted to sign up and participate because nobody trusted what was going to happen with their data afterwards. And, you know, to me, that's kind of like a very kind of glaringly obvious example of if people don't trust the healthcare system, and they don't participate, we're in a whole lot of trouble. So, uh, you know, I, I think we need to kind of rethink the foundation of why can't we share electronic health record data? Is it really a technology issue or are we really talking about business initiatives and objectives? Because part of it, and again, I know we're going to get to Tefka at some point talking about this. You bet. You know, when high tech came through and people implemented electronic health records, I think it was just assumed that data would be shared. Yes. No one thought you'd create a cottage industry out of not sharing your data. And it gets to the point now where people are thinking, you know, if you want me to do it, I need a business reason. You need to pay me for it, which is why there's all this push towards government to try to fund it or some other type of business initiative like life sciences access to EHR data to query it to fund this type of interoperability. We need to figure out how to change that. And then that should honestly adjust a lot of the limited access. You know, there's a um, uh, also an issue of cost. Some, you know, and that's kind of all over the place. If some, if you request uh, your health records, not just necessarily in a on an emergency basis, uh, trying to access, you know, interoperability. Uh, somebody who's a hospital is trying to do that, but if an individual wants access uh, or copies of the health records, that varies from provider to provider and state to state. So I think the the complex nature of cost uh, around the sharing data. I, I mean, I'm not going to lie, Jim. I, I've uh, I've started using my chart uh, with some of my providers, mm-hmm. and I'm starting to pull in some of the information, and it's it's not bad. It actually pulls in a lot of the information. I never thought I'd say that about an Epic product, not to insult anybody. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, it's not bad in pulling in my information. I still have to sign multiple consents because some yes. of my folks are on the network, some are in a network. Mm-hmm. But I still keep my own file of hard copies of my information mm-hmm. just because I need to get access to it. And there are still the times, especially when I go for to radiology, that I get the infamous CD-ROM. Yes. With my information on it. And I don't know about you, Jim, but, you know, it's 2023. I do not have a CD-ROM player. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's a big DICOM image on it. Yeah. And, and yep. you just wish it was in a cloud somewhere. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's part of it is I know people want to have that image. They may or may not be able to interpret as well as a, as a clinical person or a technical person. But, you know, part of it is is also because of that lack of connectivity and interoperability, being able to take that image with you and even in a CD-ROM and give it to somebody else that might be in front of your care, really the only common piece in all the healthcare is the patient themselves. So, yeah. you know, but the but in terms of the cost, there is that question of, you know, 
what is it, a nickel, maybe a dime for a CD-ROM, yes. or or a couple of a uh, couple of pennies for a page. You shouldn't be charging a patient a dollar, you know, especially you know at least if you're giving them a printout. And I think for us, right, even when I'm requesting through and I have to go through the fax machine, that's, you know, that's at least 20, 30 pages that are just getting printed out of ink that I have to read through and scan through yes. for the right. piece of information I need. So there's there's a lot of waste when we talk cost about obtaining mm-hmm. that information. And I do think people are trying to structure it so that there's more of a business initiative or incentive to make it easier to get. but. I don't know. There's got to be a better way to solve for this because we're all we're really doing is restricting access to information that can make it, the patient's care be better. The, it, right there, it, there's no justification for any restriction whatsoever. No. Um, uh, let me just mention to our audience: if you're just joining this episode, I'm Jim Tate, and uh, today on the Tate Chronicles, I'm speaking with Dr. George Matthew, a practicing hospitalist and. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer at Daedalus, and the topic is Challenges and Solutions to Interoperability. Uh, Before we go into uh, our, uh, well, let's just kind of go ahead with my little check list here of challenges. Administrative hurdles. Yeah. You know, that is, uh, you immediately say, yeah, so I'll just let you (laughs) comment on that, the administrative hurdles of, of getting these records. I mean, we've talked about it a bit, but, you know, Obviously, the documentation piece is onerous, right? It, it, there is a lot of consents that need to be signed, some legalese there that, quite honestly, at least for patients, may not always be transparent. And the fact is, when it comes to obtaining that data or or releasing that data, for that matter, you're not always sure where your data is going or coming from or where it's going to end up. For a provider, especially like me, that's trying to get that information, you know, somebody comes in with a very high acuity condition, let's say a car accident, I don't have time to be going through and filling out, you know, 15 consents to get all their information because they're visiting. Um, I've got to deal with what's in front of me now. And if there's something that's not in the records I have in front of me, say blood type or uh, allergies or specific medications that they're on or not on, it, it, it just worsens the potential uh, risks for that patient for something bad to happen. And, you know, I, while I understand the need for, you know, protecting people legally, we do need to be more creative and innovative for specific situations that allow for us to move at the speed we need to so we can get information and make the right choices for patients. And and, and I do think some of these administrative hurdles, quite honestly, are put up as as roadblocks to kind of keep getting information to and from yes. because people want to keep their patients in their system. Yes, um, they do. Well, and and that kind of uh, is, is a segue over really to the last issue I was going to touch you, touch with, which is time constraints, because you may request records, but if, uh, if there's a backlog before somebody can get to that request or the person who's handling that, is out for the day or for whatever reasons there's a delay in receiving those records yeah and and i think that's the thing a priority on my end what's the old phrase there jim oh yeah uh, <laughs> yeah a crisis on your side is not a priority on my side something exactly. like that yeah. right yeah and, and that's how a lot of healthcare feels um i i can I can't say the number of times that someone's handed off a patient to where i work because we're a level one trauma center and then when I've had to follow up on the paperwork, it's not with them. It's not with the patient. They haven't sent it over. And I'll call, but they've kind of wiped their hands at that point. They're yeah. like, well, we'll get it to you when we get it to you. Our records guy will be in on Monday. I'm like, exactly. Man, it's Friday. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you um, about uh, Data Lose. Uh, who are the customers sure. of Data Lose? How are those customers supported to overcome some of these challenges of interoperability? So our yeah. main customers in the United States, let me start a little bit about Daedalus because we're, sure. we're a global company. Um, we're based out of Italy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are in at least 70 countries uh, all over the world. You know, we're 
if not the biggest, one of the biggest uh, health IT companies in the world. Um, our U.S. presence is kind of uh, is growing mm-hmm. uh, because a lot of what people have had to deal with in Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, um, Australia, they've had to deal with a lot of the issues that the U.S. has, maybe at a smaller scale, but they've had to deal with a lot of the different issues of uh, having a better EHR or having interoperability or having to do telehealth. Um, we do all of that in other parts of the world. Here, we specifically focus on interoperability because we see that there is a huge need for information to be transferred securely and accurately from point A to point B. You know, our clients here in the United States are specifically uh, healthcare systems. Uh, as you know, a lot of them have expanded greatly through mergers and acquisition, uh, but they're also now starting to engage with each other and really start trying to figure out how to exchange information quickly. You know, we support them by being the pipes, which I think you described earlier, making yes. sure that information moves quickly and support all the stuff they build on top of it. So let's jump over. Uh you know, we only have about uh, five or six more minutes, and there's a few things I want to cover, but let's spend at least a couple of minutes on TEFCA. You mentioned it early. Uh, yes. TEFCA, you know, we had the regional health information uh, organizations. We had the health information exchanges. Uh, they really didn't talk to each other, and now we have uh, at least the applications for the first qualified health information networks that yep. hopefully will be going live by the end of this year the network of networks, how do you see that in terms of interoperability? Is there a lot of promise there? I, I think so. Um, it, and I say that just because, you know, just like you have seen the HIEs and the Rios before that all try to figure this out. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of it came down to, do you have a revenue model? Are you self-sustained? Right. Do you need government money? Um, and I do think that TEFCA tries to take the standards approach and they've found, you know, the, the QHINs, right, the Qualified Health Information Networks that they've chosen are folks that are known in the industry to, you know, either have good standards, uh, a good membership, and really kind of accelerate this to allow for exchange between not just uh, different hospital systems, but between the EHRs themselves, which has really been kind of the issue for a lot of this. Um, some of them are new ones like Health Gorilla. Yes. Some of them are old ones like, uh, you know, Care Quality. But I think as long as the mission is met and, you know, they can agree on standards that a majority will agree to, that exchange will happen. Uh, I see great promise there. Uh, one thing I've been uh, uh, thinking about and learning about is all QHINs are not going to be identical. Uh, some like uh, uh, it looks like Epic is going to be one of the qualified health information networks. Yep. But I imagine that is going to be only offered to uh, uh, Epic users. Um, and the real difference, and and some, uh, at least one, is going to be very geographically focused, while other ones will be like, you know, all over the country. Anybody can become a participant or sub-participant. But they'll, um, I expect there'll be a difference in the value added for different ones. Um, and so if you are in a hospital and you make a request on the TEFCA network and it uh, pulls um, and brings back responses from all the, the QNs, it, it may essentially be uh, include duplications on medications. You know, all these records uh, yeah. may not yeah. be aggregated. So some are going to offer that. Some some are not. So it's going to be fascinating to see who offers what in terms of value added. Right. And I think a lot of that's going to fall on the on the Sequoia project, uh, right? They're kind of, you know, I remember the old diagram with the umbrella, with the recognized coordinating entity. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think a lot of that's going to fall on Sequoia to kind of navigate through that. But they do have extremely experienced data folks that have, you know, they've played in this data, in this yes. field. They yes. kind of know what to anticipate. And, you know, you can never do 100%, but they'll probably get, you know, typical 80-20, right? Yeah. They'll yeah. probably get 80% of it. it. It sounds like we're both um, cautiously optimistic. Yes. Which is that a good is place exactly to go. the right way to put it. <laughs> but before we totally run out of time, um, for our listeners who want to uh, find out more about the solutions offered by Data Loose, where should they go? Uh, if 
people want to find more out about us, uh, we're at daedalus.com backslash N-A. That's D-A-D-A-L-U-S dot com backslash N-A for North yeah. America. Right. Um, I know uh, Daedalus is a sponsor at the upcoming Vive conference. Uh, I'll be at that uh, March 26th through 29th in Nashville, Tennessee. And if anybody's going there, it'd be pretty easy to find the Daedalus people and catch up uh, with them. I would I would encourage people to come up to us. Uh, I would, they they should look for uh, Damon Hour. He's yep. our general uh, general manager and executive for the North American market, and has a wealth of knowledge about this and other topics. And honestly, like all of us, is just looking to try to help people do what they need to do. Yeah. I, I've interviewed Damon and met him, and look forward to uh, uh, hiding up with him in Nashville. To our audience, thanks for joining me on this episode of the Take Chronicles, and I offer a special salute to my guest today, Dr. Matthew of Daedalus. Dr. Matthew, thanks for coming aboard today. Jim, thank you again for having me. Really appreciate it. You can find more information on this show's program page at healthcarenowradio.com. That's healthcarenowradio.com. Until we meet again, here's wishing you smooth sailing. And safe harbors. Tape Chronicles transmission ending now.